would do is give you some background into the type of work that I was making and bring it up to date um, with Brexit and all things borders towards the end. Um, I call this part of the, the presentation the talk neither here nor there. And really it was um, because we didn't moved in nine years ago from Belfast to our very own little patch of the border. We bought an old holding and um, decided to kind of invest in um, a future that we believed in on the island of Ireland and that somewhere or other being there would be interesting, certainly as a visual artist, as, as a female, and as someone who lived and grown up in Belfast, I felt it was a it's time for kind of a journey outwards. Um, so through sharing some of my older work with you, you you'll perceive immediately the lines, divisions, dark gaping voids, walls, walls of fear, minds that were semi that are semi-detached, um, both um, people feeling adrift from the mainland of Britain and people um, like my own family feeling marooned somewhat on the wrong side of a border on the island. And it's interesting, we keep talking about the Irish border, but it's actually the British border in Ireland. The border in Ireland is the beach. It's the sea, the whole way around. It's kind of a nicer type of a border than you think of a border that's been in post since 1920. Anyway, um, these paintings were made during the um, early or the late 80s and this was made after a trip to the walled city of Derry which was the first part of the plantation of Ireland. Um, these paintings are you know quite large um, six foot by ten feet. Um, this is plantation two and there's a very obvious sense of kind of one side and the other side. And was making these paintings and observing things as I wandered around Belfast, I came to realize that we were living in a paradox of similarities, something that kind of was murdered from one side to the other and deeply patriarchal. And um, you'll notice on both sides, the women are being pinched in that little tender part under your arm or poked in the belly. So, you know, the, the experience of women on both sides of this divide is very similar. Um, and that sense of dividing school children um, by religion, um, which we still do today, even after 20 odd years of the Good Friday Agreement, we still haven't managed to have the courage to address that. In fact, I would argue that we still haven't, after the Good Friday Agreement, we didn't have the courage to do an awful lot. Um, and maybe history will, will, will um, chastise us for that. Um, towards the end of that series of work in the early 90s, I was making a whole series of these large black and white drawings about things that I'd witnessed, things that I'd seen around um, various situations in Belfast. And, and at the time that I exhibited these in Belfast, I couldn't have given them away. And it was my great delight that the Imperial War Museum bought them a few years ago um, as the first female voice from the North on that conflict. I think there was a great deal of confusion and awkwardness with the Imperial War Museum touching anything to do with the Northern Ireland Troubles. So um, it, was, it was quite an interesting um, experience discussing with them and um, bringing that to fruition. So it's, it's good that they're there. And I'm kind of immediately reminded to quote um, an African writer called Alexander Fuhr, who compares people who grow up in war zones with clay pots fired at too, too high a temperature, um, you know, in an oven that's overly hot, um, and confusingly, uh, confusingly shaped like the rest of humanity. We nevertheless contain fatal cracks that we spend the rest of our lives itching to fill. And there is something of that psyche that kind of runs through the work and runs through the personalities of a lot of people that I know and grew up with. Um, the early, early 90s, I gave myself permission to make or 
to deliver an art idea in whatever way I felt was appropriate. So I started uh, making sandwiches and making sculptural things, even though I'd trained as a painter. Um, at the time, making murals on the end of Gable Walls was a, was a big thing in, in Belfast. I, um, I thought this was interesting because I loved the idea of bringing images out of galleries and into where people were. I mean, we don't have a situation in Belfast where people are queuing to get into galleries. Um, we would still kind of be more of a literary culture, but it's changing. Um, I decided to make my own mural scale paintings, and this is uh, called Emerging from the Shamrock, and it's based loosely on a piece of uh, archive footage that I saw from the R RTE, the Irish National Broadcast Company's early footage of the Rose of Tree Festival, which was a kind of marketing tool for the, in the South of Ireland to market the Republic to an American audience as a kind of fair colleague. And here she's walking out awkwardly in a bearding costume, as any Irish woman of that era would feel. Um, the, the, the generals are kind of making uh, the scores. The, she's walking over the lilies and um, like uh, a, a kind of a, a normal rural Irish woman, she's carrying buckets. Um, these paintings were very much influenced by Autumn Deeks and George Gross, who were making figurative paintings in the time of the uh, Weimar time in, in Germany. I started making public projects as well because uh, it was kind of difficult to make a living in Belfast selling paintings. And at that time, people were still looking at <coughs> people kind of being presented with bowls of flowers and kind of pretty landscapes and stuff. Meanwhile, the city was exploding around us. Um, the, this, this was called uh, Drawing the Blinds. And basically, it took place in on the lower falls in a very famous tar rock called Divis Tar Rock. Um, I passed it every day on my way to school in, through the 70s um, on the Falls Road. And what I did was I actually um, I stopped every single person going into the, the, um, the block of flats and I basically persuaded them, cajoled, swapped stuff, twisted arms, but generally got their agreement to, uh, for them to let me do a portrait which I made on a small kind of tea toweled scaled piece of linen. Um, the army, the British army were still on top of the tower block during the entire project. Once they, they dropped a sleeping bag down, um, I, I kind of thought they were being friendly, but we eventually put all of the, the, all of the, the portraits into the windows and we switched on the lights so that the entire um, block of flats became like a beacon of light on the lower falls. And there's kind of poems and various things that kind of tied in with it. But what I did discover was that in all of the British Islands, the majority of household blinds that are sold are in Belfast. And I presume that was something to do with feeling secure when you sit down on your sofa in the evening time. And there's sort of a small degree of privacy and protection given to you by a blind, but it's also something to do with your sight. Um, the whole time I was ma I make public projects, I kind of I like to be in the studio quietly, solo, working on paintings. Um, this is a painting of Maria Farrell's jacket that she wore when she was in Armagh prison. She was one of the three people killed in Gibraltar, and I was very interested to see how the legacy of her activity, a woman who grew up and went to school beside me on the Falls Road, but who actually decided that the armed struggle was the solution, whereas I kind of ended up in the visual arts, for want of a better area. Um, this is a kind of a haunted garment. And I made a lot of paintings about garments and the kind of, um, the detritus, the things that are left after people are gone. Um, this is my response to Guantanamo Bay. It's Guantanamo a mass, I might for all you Latin scholars. Um, sometimes, um, art is about a conversation. And I realized being female uh, and being a visual artist certainly wasn't something celebrated at art school when it was, where it was very definitely preferable to be male. But I realized when I got out of that kind of uh, strange environment that when you actually kind of work as, a, as an 
largest uh, female. Somehow there was a less threatening overtrain. Um, I sold the painting to a policeman who asked me if there was ever anything he could do for me. And three days later, we were down at the weapons holding um, place in Carrick Fergus, where I had asked him to let me have some AK 47. So I didn't get moving around the building. Um, but what I did do was I cast this AK 47, um, and I cast it in chocolate, which is something of a kind of a romantic food. It's, it's very much a luxury food. And a very simple policeman carried this chocolate AK 47 through um, security and flew to London, where it was exhibited in the ICA, just on the corner. And people in London smelled the chocolate and were, were very kind of taken with that whole olfactory chocolateness. I also showed it in West Belfast during the West Belfast Festival. And people kind of approached it in hushed terms, read the serial number, and wondered where I got that. <laughs> um, it was incredible that one artifact could have such different, you know, such a totally different interpretation. Um, conversations um, continued and continued during the time and before the Good Friday Agreement was actually signed, and the whole kind of decommissioning in. Northern Ireland was very interesting. And I had this notion that somehow or other we should keep one of those watchtowers and transform it into an artwork so that we would actually be very witness to what we had all lived through, but also we were taking higher ground. And I managed to get that conversation going right up through the Northern Ireland office until one morning a man called Colonel Harbour phoned me and asked me which watchtower I wanted. Um, so the next thing I knew, I was being flown down to South Armagh in a helicopter um, with cameras and inside the watchtower that used to look over the main Belfast to Dublin Road. Now you have to kind of remember, I was 12 when the trouble started when that watchtower appeared, I was about 13. And every time we went to my grandmother's, my father would kind of usher the threats and, and basically tell us to be quiet in the back, they could hear you. And there was this sense of a big eye in the sky. And I'm reminded of um, I'm reminded of Laura Mulvey's attitude towards the male, the male gaze. Not only was I aware of the male gaze, I was aware of the shortcomings of the male gaze in that they could see me, I couldn't see them. Um, they could also hear what I was saying, because through that little um, journey, I discovered that they could hear up to a mile and a half away, what people were saying, and they could read newspapers up to four miles away. So most of that equipment that was on the top of that mountain, called Fogonitra, on the, on the Irish-British border, um, went to Iraq. But I did manage to get into that watchtower, which I, I can't explain to you what a feeling it was to actually get inside to see what they could see. Here, I know you can see a terrible one, is the word south is written. Obviously, north is on the other wall, east and west. Just in case you were a 17 year old in Birmingham, weren't quite sure where you were. Um, the mountain that you see here in the distance, the Cooley Mountains, were the ultimate gorilla of Irish history, Cuchulain, one of the ancient Ulster sagas, defended Ulster from invaders. So it was always a difficult place, always a problematic place, but this was the ancient passageway into Ulster. And eventually um, the project kind of wouldn't work out, but it did feed an enormous amount of work. I couldn't bring it any further um, than I managed to get because you know we actually managed to get up to a point where they were ready to open an international competition from the southern side and they put up three and a half million. And then the Celtic Tiger died on its feet, and it didn't seem like such a good idea to be spending three and a half million euros on a peace monument on the border. So this is all gone, and there's a tricolor on that spot instead, which I think is kind of limited. Um, the Thaw project was a was a um, a response to a suggestion that we rebuild the Titanic as part of a bid for the capital of the culture in Europe. And I genuinely believe Belfast has something essential, something really important to offer um, that whole European capital culture thing because of the identity crisis, because of the whole sense of what we have gone through in the last 25, 30 years. But
But I thought the most interesting part of that Titanic narrative was the end. And a good artwork should open up the end of the, of the narrative and explore it. And obviously, the end of the narrative in that was the, the, the iceberg. And I wanted to engage with that iceberg. I wanted to try and bring an iceberg to Belfast. That kind of ultimate opposite of all the burning fire and hatred that had gone around the world to represent that piece of ground that I live on. The, the main conversation about global warming that is kind of thundering down towards us as we sit would eradicate all borders, all, all notions of nationality because that huge energy of nature would shake us off like fleas or a horse um, This obviously didn't come to pass. It's not possible as an individual to bring an iceberg somewhere on your own. What it did do was educate me in terms of how artworks are perceived in Belfast. And people either thought this was incredible, and mostly it was from an international audience, but the local people were very much against it. And I think it was to do with the fact that the local artistic community feared that somehow or other if this project happened, there'd be no public funding left for them. I'm not sure. It seemed like too big an idea to bring into Belfast. And I, that was when I realized it was a very strong, very clear colonial headspace, alive and living and struggling in Belfast. That an idea like this would work in Paris or New York. Indeed, they had a very interesting project with ICE in Paris for the, the global software. But in Belfast, it just was kind of, the timing was just not quite right. It was too big an idea. It continued to pulse into my work in different ways. Obviously, it was a departure. I kind of felt that I had, I left Belfast not long after I kind of explored that thought project. And I moved to um, our patch of the border. I now work in this courthouse in the on the southern side of the border in Ballycommon. And um, they've given it to me. They actually want me to be happy and warm and they're very kind to me. They even left me a fly, which I didn't mind. They took down, I've never had a fly in my life. Um, they took it down because in case they upset me. But um, I do like being angry. Um, I made a big project in Derry called the Shirt Factory, where literally I recreated the Shirt Factory in one of the basement areas of the former Shirt Factory in Derry. I employed six women, so this wasn't a project, a community project that was like glancing past. I, I wanted to kind of bed it into the community, and I got six young women who could sew. We paid them. There was an active kind of hum of sewing machines when you went into the project. It was a museum area where we kind of catalogued and, and um, created a, an archive about the legacy of women's work in that city. And we also had um, we also had a factory shop, which was the beginning of another project. But right now I'm showing you images of drawings because drawings are my kind of go-to methodology when I start to think about something I make drawings. Um, and I continue to make drawings. Sometimes they end up as final pieces in themselves. This is a huge drawing of a laundry piece that's now in Japan. Um, William Street, where that famous photograph of Father Daly waving the white cloth handkerchief um, in front of Jackie Daly's bleeding body. Um, we turned it into laundry there. And it was something like kind of a, a washing out, a clearing, a, a sense of um, transcendence, a sense of um, somehow looking up to the sky and clean shirts were hung up on a Monday. Um, here is Ivan Cooper, who was a shirt factory manager and also one of the former members and instigators of the civil rights movement, who told me that when they called, the women in the shirt factories came out on strike. Otherwise, they couldn't have made the civil rights movement work. Um, this is the very first poster of the very first um, civil rights demonstration in Derry. And I got to thinking that somehow or other, this was like a, a call to action for everybody who believes in fair play. The, the, the march was on a Sunday afternoon. So instead of kind of sitting on the sofa, digesting the Sunday dinner. It was about getting up and going out of your comfort zone. We made these pillows, we backed them with recycled men's shirts, and we sold them in the shirt factory. So it was like literally coming up with an art idea 
the women made in the factory that we then offered to the public. And it worked, it worked really well as a functioning kind of community project. Um, I even got to start thinking about making other things, because I moved to the country and I was concerned that I would end up kind of being a jam maker or something. But I realized I spent 20 years of my life exiting the domestic scene to get into the studio. So it was now time to go back into the pantry and explore. I made this be special honey. And a local friend told me, well, you can't do that, it's not funny, they killed people. And these were kind of a private police, well, they, they were a, a, an arm of the police that we had for a long time in Northern Ireland. And they were set up to defend the Protestant Ulster. Um, but the idea of ma making it into a jar of honey was about relieving ourselves of that bitter taste of history. And somehow realizing that as individuals, these men were loved by someone. They may not have been loved by one part of the community, but certainly as individuals, they were cared for. So I like that kind of dichotomy between honey being something nourishing and sweetening, and kind of the challenges that a difficult and problematic history throw us. Um, this became the thought cabinet, which was my way of kind of working out ideas that I've been thinking about in that high school project into a very practical, kind of politically engaged, familiar, ordinary, everyday commodities like uh, Ulster vinegar, which is bitter to the last drop, Carson marmalade, dry your eyes, post-conflict tissues, bridge over the troubles of water, and the border butter beans, there, uh, oh yeah, and the Padre Pierce pasta sauce, um, which kind of seeds me beautifully onto the souvenir shop, which was all about the legacy and looking back at 100 years of Irishness on the island after the rebellion. Now, in 2016, I managed to get one of the big commissions for Dublin to create what was to become the souvenir shop. And it was based on Thomas Clark, Thomas Clark's news agent in Dublin, Thomas Clark being one of the kind of central figures in the in the rebellion. Basically was selling newspapers and cigarettes up front. I was printing all sorts of subversive missives in the back. And I liked that idea of a shop being one thing and another. Plus I liked and um, wanted to explore the, the kind of intricacies of that time. Um, Free State Jam. Surrendered to the sweet taste of summer fruit, without spreading jam, there can be no redemption. And I mean, jam looks very like what I lived through for 30 years. Here is a very particular series of photographs in the National Museum in Dublin, and it's Padre Pierce taking the surrender uh, with two British officers in Lower Street. The first image on your left, you can see additional feet underneath his coat. This is Maria Farrell, who was the nurse who went up and down that street three or four times before Pierce came out of the GPO to agree to the surrender. So in some ways, Maria, um, Elizabeth Farrell was the hero of that day. The second photograph, the expression of the British Army officers' faces have been altered. The third photograph, Padre Pierce standing there heroically, solo, without any nurse at his side telling him to rise up. I create these sewing kits in memory of Nurse O'Farrell because I was taught Irish history. I was, um, I took it to A level um, and I've never encountered the story of um, Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell. She was literally airbrushed by the Irish history. Um, so that gave me a very clear kind of route into that project. I wanted to make um, work that was very much a female view of history. Because there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting um, thing I came across with that, who gets to tell the story and in what way? Who must remain a silent character in the story told about them? Um, women artists who speak candidly, not just about wider social issues, but their own lives <coughs> are staging mighty revolutions every day. Um, I worked with the ICA, which is the Irish Country Women's Association, um, which are a phenomenal force in Ireland, and not at all as conservative and as 
kind of um, middle class as the, the equivalent in the north, which is the Women's Institute. Um, my grandfather was a, died in a song in a British Army uniform. Um, I created this product for the shop, which is a collection of sticking plasters, you know, band-aids, because they ran out of they ran out of bandages at the song, they were so successful at killing. Um, and I also wanted to have that kind of multi-directional thing about memory and that sense of value or exchange. So we very much had a shop with these strange and idiosyncratic products um, that were based on my personal family experience. These are the bandages, put my, put my grandfather back together bandages. Um, Unite Ireland sewing kit. This looked into if it's if it's anything to go by in terms of what we sold in the shop locally in Dublin and beyond. Um, I think don't be surprised if that is the outcome of Brexit because this was singularly the most popular um, piece that we produced. And we produced a series of 15 various tea towels that had a lovely sort of domestic feel to them. But they were all seriously, you know, um, scorchingly political and, and humorous. Because I realised so much of what I have lived through has been mediated and ameliorated by humour, that dark humour in Belfast that kind of helped people to get out of things. Um, here is Crossroads dancing. My mother is in the centre, in a forehand ring with Padraig Pierce on the left. My father on the right. Her alter ego behind her. And he's dancing her off to all things rusted and orange and industrial in the north. On the left, all that she left in that green ruralness of Central Ireland. Um, and she grew up in Devon Ireland's Ireland. She was taught all her subjects in Irish, except religion, because they wanted to make sure she understood that. Um, and I grew up in a very different Ireland in Belfast. I went to school through the 70s on the Falls Road. Um, there was a sense that um, things were changing all around us. And it was, it, was, it was a strange time of kind of fear and excitement and also a very, a very um, palpable sense of history right beside you. Um, I converted all of that um, lived experience and all of those notions and feelings into a whole series of work for the souvenir shop. These were the women, I like to think of them as the women with the bottle. Um, the armchair Republicans, there's Conley on the left, who had to be strapped to a chair and executed because he was injured. And there is unmistakably Bobby Sands in that red and black jumper that his mother made for him. Um, so there was, there was lots of um, little kind of anecdotes. I bought the content of an old shop in Bonroy, quite close to my studio in Malcolm. Lots of the little rural shops along the borders have all have completely closed up. Um, so we bought the counter, we, the, whole, the whole interior, um, including the St. Anthony's prayer box. And this poster on a jar of golf stoppers that were free in the shop comes from um, a, uh, an archive in the Lynn Hall Library, which was basically cautioning people in pubs in West Belfast to think about who's sitting next to you because they were well aware that MI5 were gathering information. Um, we took on an old Georgian house, a derelict Georgian house in the middle, I went in and I saw the front room kind of being partitioned into kind of smaller units so that they could be rented as bed sits. I immediately thought, this is it, because the biggest thing that came out of 1916 for me was the partition and the, yeah, the border. This is a whole series of seeds that are based on the causes of war and conflict. We didn't guarantee what would grow if you sowed desperation or a pack of hunger and damage or brutality, but the whole idea of tithing these seeds and having them kind of sprouting in people's gardens seemed uh, appropriate to a time when we were examining that legacy of 100 years and what we had failed to deliver. Here's the shop, that's the other side of the shop. We dealt with all sorts of 
we, uh, we actually have beautiful aprons celebrating all the women that were interned. Um, that project traveled far and wide. I bought a whole series of Eastern European army boxes and sent an edition of the entire content of the shop out to various parts of Ireland, same way as you would if you were running the revolution. Um, it subsequently went to the mattress factory in, uh, in Paris, it went to Manchester, it went to, um, there's, uh, it went to Brussels, um, and there are a couple other destinations that are kind of on the cards. But when it went to the mattress factory in Pittsburgh, it was very interesting. I really wanted to get some of the local African American people that were living right beside the mattress factory to come in and work with me producing some of the stuff. But Unfortunately, they are not the clientele or they are not the visitors who go into the Mattress Factory Museum, which seems to me deeply problematic. However, they did enjoy seeing Martin Luther King's face staring at them from what was a shop on stage in their area. And it was kind of a nice partnering up of the Civil Rights March cushion that obviously was inspired by the African American Civil Rights Movement and the I Have a Dream Pillow. Um, scraps and parts of the material that we had left over uh, became transformed into Trump voodoo dolls. Um, it's amazing what you can do with a, a bit of stitching. Um, and we, we, we actually claimed to have turned back the, the, the some of the legislation that was going through in healthcare at the time for the, the, the simple act of, of those dolls. Now, finally, I'm getting on to the um, the project in Belku and Black Lion. Belku is on the southern, uh, is on the northern side. Black Lion is on the southern side. It's um, a sort of semi-detached village with a butcher, uh, fancy restaurant, uh, and the undertakers is on the Black Lion southern side of the bridge. And on the northern side, you have the supermarket, petrol pumps, and bed and breakfast. So. You really kind of uh, begin to kind of picture this small village that is kind of cut in half by this piece of water that became the Irish border. And in 1920, when they were drawing up the Irish border, uh, the Border Commission was it started off initially interviewing people and having farmers come along and make their you know make their calls as to why their piece of land should be in the south and not the north, or should be in the north and not the south. And it was taking so long with so many people, you know, kind of concerned and you know speaking personally about their ground and, and where which way it should fall, that eventually the British lost patience and just started drawing lines. So what starts out maybe as a plausible solution quite often ends up in a complete and absolute mess. On the left hand side is a vintage image of the original kind of border checkpoint or the border thing, so they're kind of smiling at each other in a friendly sort of way. This is the dead center stone of that bridge, which happens to have four holes that your fingers fit into perfectly on either side. I still haven't got to the bottom of that. Um, we were creating stories about that. That's why Irish literature is so good. There's, there's an invention, there's kind of, there's at least three stories for every, every find. I started working with women from the north, women from the south, and traveller women who are from either or. And it's very interesting that traveller women in Ireland, or the traveller community in Ireland, tends to be a kind of a place apart. They're separate. Uh, traditionally, they lost their land. They moved around. They, they, people were deeply suspicious of them. There's a lot of prejudice. But they know what it's like to pass boundaries or not to be allowed through borders and boundaries, which is why I really kind of um, went the extra mile to get them involved. And there happens to be a very special holy well on the Belcoo side of the border. And the travel room, this is, this is a big place of veneration and ancient belief. So you get all sorts of strange things hanging from trees and ribbons and mass cards. And, if you've ever seen a holy well, or if you've never seen a holy well, you owe it to yourself to go and have a look at one. Anyway, um, I got these women to start making dolls because they were, you know, the whole idea of being involved in an art project was somewhat abstract for them. But I knew that they could actually 
get them the idea of making a doll that somehow they would have had as a child. So the dolls ended up being quite kind of fetishized and that's something you would find on a holy well tree. Here's um, two diligent workers um, from the traveling community and a sign that I borrowed from the country of the, the, the road guys in Cavan. We, trans we basically created an artwork incident on the border. Um, I got people to gather up anything they had in terms of waste clothing that was bright, clean, and it possibly had kind of a bit of stretch to it. So we had all sorts of stuff. We've, we made these big orbs, big kind of fat cushions, and the idea being that we would soften quite literally um, upholster that bridge. Um, I was inspired partly by the fact that when IKEA came to Ireland, it opened its first place in Belfast. And at the weekends, people in Belfast knew not to go to IKEA because all the southerners were in IKEA, you know, buying kitchens and sofas and what have you. And I actually contemplated writing a PhD thesis on the unification of Ireland through soft furnishings <laughs> and IKEA. Um, anyway, it's amazing what really works when it, when it all boils down to it. Most people want a little bit of comfort and pretty much the same as everybody else. Um, women in the North met um, on a Tuesday night for a knitting uh, group that crocheted and knit very close to that bridge. So I find my border knitters and I love the idea of them sitting, literally crocheting the border together. Um, of course, all of that project over the last 20 years has been funded by funding from Brussels so that communities could actually uh, work together, socialize together, knit together. And the real threat from Brexit is that all that energy, all that human communication, all that kind of empathy and pathos, one woman was very ill, they were all going to, to visit her. It was that whole sort of human communication that you only get when a group of women come together regularly. Would be dissipated, would simply be taken out by one stroke of somebody's pen in Westminster. And I think that's a real tragedy. Um, the dolls, the, the, the figures became the harsh scally dancers. Um, people came back and added more bits and pieces to the installation that was there. Um, that's the image that Edwin showed, showed you. It literally kind of was one length of the parapet. And very similar to what happened in 1916 in Dublin, we took the local post office as our headquarters and it was, it was empty, so I kind of made that my base camp where people could come and get more information on the project, where they could add things or they could pop in and see some of the archive footage that I had, and we launched the project from there. Um, what was very interesting was people started to kind of interact with what was what, what being put on the border. And one, one day I came along and somebody had drawn cross-border hopscotch. So here's a man in midair, literally not knowing where he is, transcending the border, caught in a split second over that line. And um, I continue to make project, I, mean, I continue to make products for the souvenir shop as it moves along. This is the label for the broken Brexit family biscuit tin, um, which is literally a tin of biscuits that is about the fracturing, the breaking, the somehow um, the inhospit the, the lack of hospitality, um, the, the, the kind of the basic wrongness of turning away from what was a vision of a unified Europe after the Second World War. Um, and this this image is a label for fabric softener. Huge numbers of people come from the west of Ireland up to Inniskillen to the Asda store, which is the most profitable store on the planet. They buy large boxes of washing powder because it's three pounds cheaper than it is in the south, and they buy fabric softener. So this is my label for an Irish border comfort, comfort being a brand name of a fabric softener. And the kind of delusional stupidity of separating people and having a sense of kind of um, 
going backwards instead of forwards. Um, and finally, my image from London, because you always have to have, have a, the last kind of immediate image. This morning when I was coming over here, I noticed on the armrest between seats in the tube station, some, somebody had actually uh, placed a sticker. It says, it reads really, no, compro no compromise, Brexit means Brexit. And here we have Britannia and the Lion, very like the song medal that my grandfather got after he died, who didn't get the family got it, but you know that image of Britannia as some really something kind of um, very retrogressive, ultimately massively nationalist, and, and really a symbol of the chaos that we're we're living through. Um, now I'm finished and I'm happy to um, take questions. and then I'll open it up to the, to the floor. Um, so I've noticed uh, Brexit is often described as unstitching and semantics around thread often crop up in, you know, around negotiations. Theresa May is often described as hang, hanging by a thread. Um, I was interested in why that, those craft materials specifically interest you in, in that context of Brexit. Well, I think thread and cloth and literally the fabric of life, is a good way to describe um, some of the kind of uh, divisions and fractures within Ulster, Ulster um, society. I mean, it's a, it's a place where traditionally um, linen was, was manufactured and you have the wharf and the weft, you know, kind of, and to me it seems like sometimes um, I live in a community where where some people are going that direction and it's the other come you know the other is is a completely different direction but that's that's a kind of quite a positive constructive thing because if we can cooperate you, you end up with a beautiful cloth if you don't cooperate you end up i suggest Theresa may well Theresa may <laughs> may end up with um, a very kind of tattered confused ball of thread that is of no use to anyone I love that metaphor. <laughs> um, so I'd like to open up to questions. Would you like to? Um, as I was very interested in that last project where you've got people making. With the dolls, did you bring people from different backgrounds? You mentioned the travellers, but from the yeah. town and village as well, into those same sessions? No, well, the travellers were sessions on their own right. because they're quite, they, they won't mix. And I was just interested because my experience really of encouraging people to is the exchange of stories that happens while they're thinking about making because people actually tell their life story, Absolutely. Their stories and you can actually share between people who have very different life experiences I was wondering how you Oh, the Tuesday, the Tuesday evening border knitters thing, I mean they were just getting together about the market house and, and the one big thing was at 9 o'clock the kettle was put on the tea was made <coughs> down needles and crochet hooks and the biscuits and the the, you know, and the chat. And of course, these are all women that live in rural communities. They're, you know, they're by and large living in farms. So there's, there's obviously concern and, uh, you know, and, and real genuine cons you know, worry that somehow or other, if this goes through, if those watchtowers re reappear or if those checkpoints delay traffic, there'll be, there'll be a whole other thing going on. Plus, um, I think there's a real, a, a very real possibility that we could return to violence because it's totally and absolutely unacceptable to um, a huge number of people, including my neighbours, that will not 
um, countenance a hard border coming down. I mean, it would be a betrayal of everything that we've worked for for the last 20 years. Um, yeah, there's a lot of playfulness and ambiguity with your shock pieces, like the Civil Rights Commission. But of course, you still speak of very contested histories. There have been a couple of civil rights conferences in Derry and Belfast in the last couple of weeks, and you can see that people still have very different uh, opinions on what happened. And when you look at pieces outside of Ireland, then people may not be familiar with those contexts. And because usually, of course, if it was an art object, then it would have some kind of contextualization. So I'm just wondering how you navigate that, particularly when the work travels. But with the Civil Rights Commission, for instance, that people aren't aware of the context that it was a civil rights march, it was a peaceful march, but you know, over 70 people had to have their skulls x-rayed because they were beaten so badly by the police that day. So it's just some of the ambiguity and playfulness and how to navigate that when there are these kind of real moments of trauma that you're, that you're speaking to as well. Well, I think, I think the civil rights cushion um, works in itself in that a cushion is something that is kind of about restfulness or repose. Um, Getting up and going to the Civil Rights March in 1969 is something about moving very definitely out of your comfort zone. Um, I came across a man who had kept the dry cleaning ticket from his suit that was soaked in blood after he was bludgeoned over the head by an REC man. And so people were well aware who went on the, that march that they were kind of stepping out and, and making history in some ways. Um, I don't think there was anything contested about it. I can't see how anybody would object to people demanding civil rights, unless you were some sort of died in the wool DUP supporter. You might possibly object to that having, you know, that, that march happening. Um, but there was a playfulness in it, and at the same time, there was a pro productivity in it. Like I wanted to kind of bring that back in and make sure that. Um, those six women that came from the bog side were earning a, a kind of standard working wage for sewing those. So I quite like the idea of renegotiating that power structure between the tourist, the random photographer who shows up and takes photographs in, in kind of more torn, torn areas of Belfast and then walks away again. I wanted to create a project that not just showed people what was happening or how it happened, but that actually Move the, move the structure or the, the, the engagement on somewhat. I mean, I hate those tours in Belfast where you go, you, you take a ride in a black taxi, you're given the Republican version of the, the troubles, you're handed over to a loyalist taxi driver, you come down the Shanky Road and you're given the loyalist version of that. And meanwhile, it's like, it stays stuck. There's no, there's no further, there, you, you're not pushing it on any. And I, I wanted to do something that was challenging things on, on, and our values of things, what we value from, from that past. Oh dear. I feel like sewing and just working with fabrics in general is a very gendered action. And I feel like it's something that you should depict with the women's marching band. Yeah. Like it's a Or also the materiality of the no. Straight up, there weren't. Um, I think men in Ireland who sew tend to be fishermen. I'm not sure. I've never really come across too many that work in textiles. But they just happen to be the people that I came across. I didn't go out specifically looking for, if they'd been men who were interested, they certainly could have come along. But when you get a group of women that are meeting over a long period of time, it's kind of like... It's very much a gendered thing. If you know, I'm sure if we if if men had come along and been interested and been have any good at sewing, we they would have been welcome. But it just <laughs> didn't happen that way, you know. Yeah, at the back. I 
keep hoping that Brexit is just a bad dream and I'm going to wake up someday and it, it will kind of be over. Um, or that somehow or other it will happen in Britain, but it will just leave us to get on with our kind of process of confusion. Because right now, that process of confusion is working quite nicely. And if it comes down to a kind of an either or sort of thing, it's going to become a big problem. Um, and I think it will be strongly resisted. I really genuinely believe that, I mean, there are already protests. I've already met a farmer who represents a lot of Ulster farmers in Europe. He worked as a part-time UDR man up until Good Friday Agreement. Now, this is a man who went out with a gun in the middle of the night and defended his side of the community against the other side of the community. So in the space of time that he stopped doing that, to where we are now, he is openly asking for a United Ireland. And I think that's phenomenal in terms of a short space of time, someone who actually got out of their bed at night to go and defend Ulster is now wanting to kind of take the other side of the, you know, and that's because he knows he can't sell his top quality produce in an environment where, you know, people are gonna be fed chlorinated chicken it's like it just isn't going to work and he will be out of business. So its economics have changed his political standpoint. Um, what's the state of play with the shirt factory project now? Does it still exist in some form in Derry or is it simply in the boxes that you pack up and send to other places? Oh, well, part of it went to the laundry in Cambridge. Um, they were very interested in it. I had hoped that we might have had the beginnings of a textile centre where they could have archived a lot of the stuff that we were gathering and they could have kept it going for young designers. But such is the level of bureaucracy in Derry. It was two years before I got my final check. So I kind of just left. Sometimes things just run their course. Yeah. But it, it, it definitely inspired further projects. Um, just going back to your previous point about the border and yeah. the impact that Brexit's had, I think it's quite interesting how you know the sort of softening of the border coming out of the Good Friday Agreement and expressed in that project. It's a, sort of ironic that the sort of threat of Brexit, Brexit may actually one result, which I think you alluded to earlier, might be the, that the border goes. You yeah. know, because there are a number of options if if a sort of well, I can't see how they can keep the border without, you know, essentially staying at the whole of the UK staying in the EU. So it's kind of changed, it, it seems very much from polls that it's changed people's perceptions even further on from the Good Friday Agreement. And as um, Eddie alluded to at the beginning, one of the other the things that are in the Good Friday Agreement, if it's sort of parity, is also the, a border poll is in the Good Friday Agreement mm. as well, if circumstances change. and. So I think it's quite interesting how, you know, that which, you know, that project now, the impact of Brexit may actually, you know, take that further down the line, um, you know, depending on what happens here. Well, I mean, there is a very interesting individual who lives or whose business is on the border um, and his name is Sean Quinn. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he actively made um, an incredibly successful business out of being on the border and you know generating electricity which he then sold the excess to the north or south depending on which was paying more. I mean he ended up the richest man in Europe and he was, he's like kind of an old Irish chieftain who sits plum on the border with private roads going across the mountain. I mean it's a fascinating kind of little fiefdom there and it works beautifully because he's got access to both territories and I'm not sure how it'll affect him but um, it, it, somebody should study that if they're looking at Brexit. <laughs> uh, there's a question here from Jane Hill who says um, change and Brexit and the Trump presidency 
Valley Studies are sort of coming into greater and greater fruition. Do you find yourself turning to digging further into humor as a form of visual coping? Or are you finding other artistic outlets to couple with that? I mean, I think I definitely I recognize there is humor in the work, and I think humor is a very powerful um, way of human communication. Um, I think it's there's a there's a there's less of a challenge if I can put my point of view to you without making you feel aggressive towards me. So if I can come at you with humour and pack a punch, you won't even know that that I've I've been that kind of erudite. And I think that um, humour is a very underused tool. I mean, there's satire and there's cynicism and they, but um, humor is a way of kind of taking the visual and taking the intellectual, kind of you know bending it round and creating something that seems absurd. And it's interesting to think the things that we laugh at tend to be things that confuse us or that that we don't quite understand. Things that we're f afraid of, you know, there's, there's kind of different ways. Um, different tools and different different ways that humour does things that I think when you're looking at very big serious issues it can actually help to bring a, a, a you know to, to bring a kind of a, a commonality around a subject. I have two questions actually. The first is do you work with any is there any cooperation going between artists north and south that you're aware of? Well, yeah, there's always been cooperation in North and South. In fact, I think one of the biggest tragedies from that Good Friday Agreement is the fact that they allowed arts and culture to slide off the table before they signed it. And I think it was to do with a kind of a fairly, you know, bog-headed attitude towards, well, that's not really that important. And I mean, you think arts and culture was the one area that we really could have got to grips with the kind of challenging notions of identities the whole kind of um, the, the whole cultural realm that causes that has cost us so much in terms of policing orange marches and such, um, that if that would have been put kept centre stage on the we we could have averted so much we could have flushed out so much more yeah. effectively. I mean specifically in this post effect, like the day of the vote, the day that the result was announced, I know that a lot of writers were getting in touch with each other and saying we have to keep. Yeah. before any of these other conversations happen. So I wonder if there was anything like that between artists? Yeah, well, I know from Belfast and where I am, but I also um, have been quite vocal about um, my opinion that I think the Arts Council, we have an Arts Council in Belfast, we have an Arts Council in Dublin, I think there should be only one Arts Council on the island of Ireland. It's a tiny place. Yeah. The, the, the art sector is even smaller. I mean, you had the, the, like Seamus Heaney was from Derry, school educated in Belfast, lived in Dublin. He was an Irish poet. You know, I was from Belfast. I'm now kind of working in the south. They treat me like I live there. It's kind of there's no there's no problem. They're just kind of you know where you write a book, what the book is about, can be a kind of multifaceted thing. It's lun lunacy to think that we could have we had divisions in the arts sector. Obviously, there's money available in Belfast that comes from the, the kind of Northern Ireland exchequer, and the, the money in the South is separate. But actually, quite a, quite a few artists will, will work both arts councils in order to try and kind of create enough funding to get on with doing whatever they need to do. Have you had any feedback on how uh, politically influential your pieces of work are? I'm sorry. The, Influential, the politically influential. So, any feedback on a political level, um, in terms of in the media or on, on that level? Well, it was very interesting. The day we launched the the Soften the Border project, there was a Sky News team in the area, and they'd been desperately looking for something visual <laughs> to put on the TV that kind of explained the Irish border, and they just came across it. They were like, what is this? They give a short interview, and the next thing, it went like wildfire. 
around Al Jazeera, ended up in that bridge talking to a local farmer. It's fascinating. It was a whole like, um, I, mean, I haven't envisaged this whole other bit of playing out once that hit the media. How local people would be literally given a voice to stand on the bridge and say, I don't want a passport I, to go to the butchers. You know, like it's very simple but quite poignant stuff. Um, so, yes, they found that visual thing, picked it up, and it went. And I hadn't, we didn't, we really didn't have a budget on that for, for media or PR, let me tell you. It was simple happenstance. We did have two, I mean, people tooted their horns. I mean, I wasn't sitting on the bridge all day, every day, but there was a general sense of like massive amount of traffic going from Inniskillen to the west, because that's the kind of the, the main route west. So um, the man who gave, very kindly gave us the, the post office, I mean, it was empty, he was trying to rent it. So he let us have it for the duration of the project. And I had used an old Sinn Féin poster, you know, those plastic, corrugated plastic thing. I kind of turned it round, we made our sign on it, put it up in the window and thought, perfect, you know, we have our soft border thing. But obviously the warmth coming through the window or whatever softened the tape at the top and the thing fell down. Um, so it just read like a sideways on Sinn Féin poster. <laughs> <laughs> and he got a little irate at that. He was trying to rent a shop and obviously he didn't know on a Sinn Féin poster in the front of his shop, because it was cutting in half his possibility of rental. Um, other than that, we were fine. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm continuing to add products to the souvenir shop as this moves along because it seems like a it just it, it seems like a logical move. Um, what I've been at recently, um, we've I've been kind of putting some disinformation out, where I have a soft border page on Facebook, and um, we found an injured swan that happily survived after overnighting in a shed and um, I basically put the images, really beautiful images of the swan taken with kind of a head torch down on it and the swan is kind of, you know, um, kind of grey and young and looking up and I basically saying, you know, it's, it flew into the sky wall that Brexiteers are building <laughs> above the border, you know, the, the whole idea of kind of nature not recognising any of this. Mm -hmm and like water and so I'm kind of curious about going into that area um, and literally um, making visual some of the lunacy. Um, Take me silence. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <coughs> Sorry, yes. I say open question. Have you read Anna Burns' book? 
No, but I'm happy. The first purchase when I go home, I can't wait really? to read it. It's terrific that she's won it. Um, so I have one last question, if that's all right. And Dennis, anyone yeah. else? But, um, I'm really interested in just how much food crops up in your work. Why do you think eating is such a big part of Well, I, I probably, um, I, I'll suggest that it's because I have two sons who have done their best to eat me out of house and home over the last 20 years. Um, but also, I think there's something deeply Celtic, Irish, in that notion of hospitality. And it's one of the aspects of Irishness that I kind of feel very good about. Like my mother wouldn't have let you out of the house without at least two cups of tea and four rounds of orange bracket. Generally a sense of kind of like, you have to be nourished and fed. Um, I mean, there's a whole history in Irish culture about hospitality and, and, and food. I mean, obviously you have famine, which you know, is, is in our race memory. Um, but also the notion of hunger striking, mm -hmm. which is to refuse food from another person, is the ultimate insult. It's like a, I, you know, I will not have your food, I will not have your friendship, I will not give you my respect. So the, it's a kind of, um, it's it's deep in the psyche. But um, I mean, I think recent, more recently, it's, it's appeared in my work because I moved to the country with the dream of kind of having a self-sustaining kind of homegrown vegetable existence, which, you know, is a lot of work. I'm still struggling at it, but um, it seems much better than to kind of depend totally on the Tesco truck coming across your road. Yeah. I think the other thing that, um, I mean, that's fascinating, that's super interesting. Just in the context of Brexit, food seems to become a really prominent metaphor. If you think about like fudge, cherry picking, mm -hmm. having your cake mm -hmm. and eating it, uh, taking an egg out of an omelette, a uh, packet of crisps versus a three course meal, a la carte. Food um, shortages. Yeah, and then there's the whole stockpiling thing. Yeah. I think in some ways it touches on uh, anxiety about what does it mean to be dependent on others, which is what kind of what you were alluding to there as well. But I think we're delusional if we, if we, um, if we think we can go it alone. Yeah. Because yeah. I think um, it's one, of, one aspect of the, the human psyche or the human situation mm -hmm. that we are interdependent whether we like it or not yeah. we cannot kind of um, go off and live like survivors or some sort of what is it you know kind of um, you know those American people that kind of hold up in the woods with loads of guns yeah mm -hmm. you know um, it's kind of it's it's a strange kind of reaction to something that we really need to get a little more humane about. I mean, yeah. we are going to have more refugees. We are going to have more um, climate challenges. So are we just going to let people die at sea? Are we just going to ignore the fact that, you know, there will be people from Spain needing to come mm -hmm. somewhere to live? Um, and I kind of like to think that we could develop sufficiently as human beings to actually embrace the concept of sharing and make the concept of excessive greed and um, consumerism something that we find a little bit disgusting. Yeah. And that people should die without any money left. That should be a kind of a common human goal. Because I cannot understand how you would want to be the richest corpse in the grave. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> <laughs> of course, thank you. Join me in thanking uh, <laughs>